Good morning or good afternoon or whatever it is in whatever part of the world you're in from ALBW Live. As most of you who are watching know, ALBW or Ann Lister Birthday Weekend, there it is, was a five day event that was supposed to take place in Halifax, England this weekend. And it unfortunately, um, like the lives of most of us, was canceled due to the COVID crisis. And let me just start by saying that I hope all of you are safe and well and doing the best you can in this time of isolation. We are so happy to be with you here today. So please stay safe. Um, anyway, as you know, it was canceled, Ann Lister Birthday Weekend. Uh, we have rescheduled though, and it will be coming on on April 11th through the 18th next year in Halifax. So I hope you'll join us all there because as many of our members say, it's going to be epic. Okay. Um, we are bringing you an abbreviated version of the event, and we are rolling out with the person who really started it all, Helena Whitbread. I couldn't be happier to have her here. She needs very little introduction, as she is the woman who lit that long, slow fuse. So, without further ado, ah, first, I have to thank my tech team. I'm so sorry. I want to thank Livia Labate and Steph Galloway for all the work they did putting this together for us. Thank you so much, ladies. All right, now without further ado, Helena Whitbread. Good Hello. morning, Helena. Hello, it's afternoon here. Um, English tea time, of course, 5 p.m. But how wonderful to be talking to you and to be talking to all my lovely readers and um, whoever is, is watching us here, uh, yes. what marvelous technology. Yes, yes. And as I, um, as I mentioned in the very beginning, um, Helena is the woman who lit the very long, slow fuse with the publication of this book. Ah, yes. I remember it well. Yes. And which then became this book, which of is course. the book most of yes. us now have. Yes. And of course, we're going to get to the, um, we're going to get to the, the release of the new one. But in the meantime, Helena, I'd really uh, like to start out by asking you uh, to tell us a little bit about what led to that faithful, fateful day in the archives. Um, first of all, I know you had been working on a degree at the time, or you were still working on it. Tell us a little bit about Helena Whitbread of that time. Helena Whitbread, myself, was 45 when she entered university. Uh, fulfilling a, a long-held ambition to become educated. Um, I took a degree uh, at Bradford University in politics, literature, and the history of ideas. And uh, when I'd finished my three-year degree, I, I took a, a PGCE to become a teacher. And um, from that time on, I had to um, question whether I wanted to go into uh, uh, teaching full-time, uh, or, or did I want to uh, fulfill another long-held ambition, which was to write? I had been going to some creative writing classes, and uh, although I'd written a bit of poetry and one or two little bits of short stories, I realised um, I hadn't the poet in me, um, I hadn't the novelist in me, perhaps, but what I did find out through university, what I did have in me, was the researcher. And yes, and, you did, for sure. Uh, there is a wonderful story that you told me in our discussion yesterday, and I don't remember exactly where this falls in, but you made a living for a little while as a barmaid, did you not? I did indeed, yes, part-time work down at the local pub, um, and um, it was that really that set me on this long, slow fuse that we're talking about. Uh, what happened really was, um, I left school at 13 due to ill health, so I had no qualifications at all. And I grew up with a sense of failure. I passed for grammar school, oh. supposed to be very, very bright, but due to my ill health, I had to be sent to my aunts at the seaside months to recuperate, because this was during the war, of course. I was a war child, if you like. Um, not that we had a very um, hectic war in Halifax, quite quiet war, one bomb dropped. However, um, I was working there part-time as a barmaid to bring a bit of extra money in for the family. And um, these two young men walked in, uh, students, uh, one was, and he came home on vacation. 
and he said to his friend, um, oh, I'm, I'm reading The Doll's House by Chekhov. And I reprehensibly said, uh, don't you mean Ibsen? And, and he well on me and he, he did write, he was furious. Uh, I shouldn't have said it. And he said, uh, what do you know about it? You're only a barmaid. And I said, oh, yes, I'm sorry. You know, and I you know, sort of put my head down and went on pulling his pint. <laughs> and uh, the next day he came back and he said, I owe you a pint and an apology. Uh, you were right. I said, uh, well, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have said what I said. I said. No, but tell me, why are you working as a barmaid? And I said, well, I'm, I'm not clever. I've, they said, you're reading Norwegian and Russian playwrights. You're clever. I said, Get up to the technical college and finish your education. And I took his, I took his word. And I did. And I went up to the local college. I got uh, sufficient uh, qualifications to take me into university. So at the age of 45, um, uh, due to this young man, who I've never seen since, I, uh, I went to university. I love that story. I'm so glad that you told it. It's, um, you know, there's so many, there's so many, I know that we have so many people sitting out there who, who, you know, at particular moments in their lives think, well, I've, mm. I'm this old, I can't really do anything more, right? Nonsense. Yes, I found out that was nonsense. You can do it, what you want to do. Exactly, yes. exactly right. And you yeah. can do anything as long as you put your mind to it. So tell me now. Um, Sometimes you need to push. I'm sorry? Sometimes you need a push. Yes, you do. To push you. Yes, Indeed. yes. Indeed. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you've got your degree, and then mm -hmm. you, as you told me, then you got into a situation where you were looking for something or someone to write about. Yes. And, uh, yeah. So, tell us about that. Well, yes, I decided to just do part-time teaching, supply work, and a little bit of further education teaching, so that. What I realized because of my deep love for research is that I, I wanted to write about um, personalities or, or events historically. Mm. Uh, so I thought um, I, I can go down to the archives and have a look at, I knew that Anne Lister's letters were kept in the archives, um, but I wasn't aware of anything else. So I went down this particular day and there was a young, again another young man there that I've never seen before and I've never seen since. And um, I said to him, could I have a look at the letters? And he said, uh, I've done this. And he said, yes, he put them up on the reader printer. And of course, in those days, they wrote across uh, the page and then they turned it that way and wrote across the writing. So there's like a trolley. And I can't read those letters. They're very difficult. And then he said the seven words that led me on my trail uh, through the next 35 years. He said, did you know she kept a journal? And I said, no. And he put the journal, pages of the journal up. And I saw that they were in this cryptic code. Well, they look a bit um, more difficult than the letters, actually. And um, I said, Has, is there a key to code? And I said, yes. And um, it's been cracked by the last list. So I said, well, I took a copy of the key the code home with me and I took the first 50 pages of the journal and that week I sat down uh, tried to learn the code began to decode symbol for letter symbol for letter uh, the code the code was difficult because there's no punctuation in it you don't know where one sentence starts and one finishes you don't know where there's supposed to be capital letters commas anything great lines of cryptic code but it's up to the decoder to decide just does this section of words make sense? Does it make a sentence? You know, so there was a lot of intellectual sort of organization going on. Right. But eventually, eventually, I, after five years and um, 7,700 pages, five million words, I had, um, I had two books um, ready to go to press. That, that, that's absolutely astounding. And, and you told me that you never saw either one of those two men again, the person in the pub or the never person in the them. library. Never saw them again. And, um, you know, it's, it's ridiculous really, isn't it? You have these fancy that, you know, perhaps two angels came down from heaven and took human form. Right, just tapped fantastic. you on the shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> Helena, I have something for <laughs> you to do. <laughs> <laughs> Ridiculous, isn't it? it's, it's amazing that just on two specific days, two specific men and 
hey presto we've got Anne Lister. Yes, yeah. it's just it, it really is amazing. But you were um, you were aware of Anne Lister because of course you lived in Halifax, right? You'd been oh, to yes. City Hall, and your parent. I, I think you told me that your uh, your parents used to take you as a child up there, right? Yes, they did. My, my, my father used to take us up to Stimpton Park every Sunday. He he was an Irishman, and um, because we lived in a half town that was um, quite slummy, and there were no gardens or anything, we were very poor. And um, he used to say, "These children never see any greenery," as he'd been brought up in Ireland, of course. And uh, so every Sunday after mass, which we had to go to, was he was a stone tablet. Lunch, you know, my mother cooked, and then it was up to Stimpton Park. Boy, was it a walk for little legs. <laughs> oh, <laughs> a little tiny, a little tiny Helena going up the hill. Um, Helena, so, so once, once you found Ann Lister, once you got into the journals and the, yes. the diaries, the letters, what made you choose the romantic side of Ann Lister to focus on? Because I thought that that was the most intriguing part, really. Um, I had no idea of Anne's sexuality when I started, of course. I didn't know what I was going to find. Mm -hmm. And when it gradually emerged that she was having this, um, this uh, romantic love affair with uh, Mariana Belcom, uh, uh, I just couldn't resist going on and finding out how it developed. And, uh, and although the context was absolutely fascinating as well, it was the love affair that held me. Um, and, the, and the other thing was, of course, that Anne Lister was born in the era, the Romantic era, and that, that had been a particular favourite of mine in university. You know, the French Revolution and then uh, the words with Byron, Gibbon, you know. But it just locked in really, what I'd been in at university. So it, it, just, um, it, it just seemed to me that that must be the theme that I was going to follow. In my, in my first book, uh, oh. rom romance, the political aspect of it, and the fact that it was mostly in my own local town. You know, how good was that? And, um, you know, I could walk around my own hometown and think, Anne Lister walked up these streets, or Anne Lister went into this house. Well, you, you know, the hometown for me became a very romantic place. I, 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 I'm beginning to think I'm quite romantic at heart. So, yeah, yes. it was romance. <laughs> yes. And thank yeah. God for that, because it's, it's really wonderful, wonderful to have your work covering those early parts of her life. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. In so many ways, it's, it's so touching. Um, I do want to ask you a question. Uh, I know that you have a child who's gay, correct? Yes, my daughter, yes. yes. And, and One of my daughters. I have three daughters, yes. Yes. And you, and a son, and a son. Let's, make, let's not forget him. Did that, did that have any impact on you um, in making your choice about what to cover on Ann Lister? Or, and, and she came out to you before you started the work, yes? Yes, she no? did. Yes, she did. Two years before I found the journals, uh, my daughter had come out to me as, as a gay, uh, gay young woman. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I immediately got very protective about her really yeah. um, uh, and th then um, when I found the Anne Lister stuff I had an emo enormous amount of empathy for Anne Lister yeah. because I realized that my daughter had been having a struggle and um, but how much more so perhaps or not perhaps perhaps, perhaps gay, gay women today would say no our struggle is, well, is just as bad or has been just as bad but you look at Anne Lister so isolated, as she said, um, I know my own heart and I know man, men, and I know I am different to anybody else that ever lived. She genuinely thought she was unique with her sexuality. She yes. would say, I am an enigma even unto myself. Yes. And I do excite my own curiosity. Yes. Could not understand why she had a perfectly formed uh, body of a woman uh, with all the attendant, um, you know, uh, sort of um, uh, biological functions. Right. Uh, but, but, but she had privileges mentally of a, of a man or women, and she couldn't reconcile it. I mean, she lived, she lived a very successful life despite yes. that, and she never lost her faith in God, because she would say, 
No, she didn't. She was very strong, staunch um, upholder of the church, and she's and and quite sort of um, quite deep belief in God. She would say, um, "Well, God gave me this nature, and I must act according to it. And and if I act contrary to it, I will be going against His wishes for me." You know, she yep. could reconcile. She could reconcile her sexuality as God given. You know, I've I've often thought, um, and I I was really looking forward to um, to welcoming our ALBW crowd to the Minster. And but one of the reasons for that is yes. because I can really feel Ann Lister in the Minster, and yes. I have often thought about her sitting in one of those pews, and it could have been the pew that any one of those women who had been attending our event was sitting in. Us. thinking to herself, you know, struggling with this question. Yes. yes. Who am I? How will yes. I ever find a heart to connect yes. to mine? Yes. And you um, can that, feel that. that in there. You can feel Anne and her, her time in that space. Um, but we'll do it next year, and I'm really happy. Yes, to absolutely. Do right? I absolutely feel that in those two books, the way she explored her own sexuality, and and it was a very good um, the, the way she performed the strategy she adopted, you know, to make herself acceptable, but yet not to betray her sexuality. Mm -hmm. And I think in two books that comes out very very firmly. But it it is uh, it is it is the strategy she uses really how she had to read up in the classics, how she had to uh, uh, you know she has what you might call overt strategies like dressing all in black. And then she had covert strategies like um, going back to the classics when homosexuality, of course, was a lot of it in the Greek and the Latin classics. And right. um, that was the way she she, she moved her way through life, you know. It's so uh, fascinating. You know, she was such a brilliant woman. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's very clear from her journals that her mind was very keen. Oh, very, yes. And uh, it, it's sort of interesting. She used the uh, the journal as her own therapy, and she mm, yes, she did mm. right. And she used reading the classics, whatever she could find, has yeah. her own form of the internet mm. to find other gay women out there. Yes. Really, yes. Yes. right? Yes. At least that she could read about. So, quite a um, life. Uh, so, so then moving to the publication of your book, um, it tell us a little bit about how you found your publisher and how that happened. Well, um, I'd, I'd worked um, on my own for about five years. Uh, and uh, when I got this massive material together, uh, you know, at one point it was all one book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, I, I, where is the best publisher for this? I was very naive. I didn't even approach an agent or anything like that. I just got the writer and artist yearbook and looked down and had a look for um, publishers that would take women's studies and things like that. And I thought at the end that Virago, Virago was the best for the unlisted material. Mm. Uh, so, um, you know, hats off to Virago, shall we say? Yes. Absolutely. Um, mm, uh, they've, played a, they, they've played a big part in the publication of um, women's studies books. You yes, know. absolutely. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful publishers and stayed with me um, all through the 35 years when my, my work has laid dormant, yeah. you know, and... Um, Were they new at that time? Virago was a fairly new publisher at oh, that time. Oh, yes, yes. I'm, I'm reading uh, Lenny Goodin's book now called A Slice of the Apple, and she, uh, she talks about the history of, of Virago. She was in virtually at the beginning, and it just started with a little a group of women I won't say that round the kitchen table, but you know, so, 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 what shall I say? So, so um, uh, like a small, a small, um, you know, a right. tree that would then would flourish later. But yes. certainly in the beginning, and my book, in when I sent it to them in 1988, they weren't putting all that many out. I think they've been in business about 10 years then. So mm -hmm. for them to take it on, you know, it's been an immense, immense thing for me really. And it, it was all in one book at first, but what they said to me was, it's too long, you know, you're going to have to cut some, some down. 
And I thought, no, I, I don't want to do that. So what I thought I would do is I would take the whole of the Maria Barlow uh, uh, passages out and make uh, my second book, No Priest But Love. Yeah. Very smart. Yep. Yeah. So originally that was part of the first book. But then I realized there was so much material in this Parisian adventure and love affair that this would be a complete book in itself. So Virago and I came to an agreement that uh, I would take out the uh, No Priest But Love, which are, uh, what, how it gets the title is in, in, in Paris. And Lister says to Maria Barlow, shall we get married? And Maria Barlow says, how can we? We have No Priest But Love, you know. Yeah. So that's where I get that title. That's for that. I've been wondering about that. Yeah. And I, I did read someplace, you and I did not talk about this yesterday, but uh, or in the last few days. Um, but you did go to Paris and do some research, did you not? I did. I went two or three times to Paris, yes, yeah. to research. And I was sat in this little uh, little um, uh, uh, office in, on the left bank of the Rue de Bac. And um, they had every single clipping, painting, photograph, anything you could um, uh, want about Paris. And it was stored there in an archive. Mm -hmm. And I took a friend with me, a French woman, who was a colleague at school. She'd been brought up in Paris. And we sat there, sweltering hot days, in this tiny little office. And um, she would, I would tell her what I wanted, and she would tell the archivist. And they would, um, and one that I got was prostitutes in Paris, yes? Oh. Because when, when, Ann, when Ann Lister was looking for somewhere to live, uh, Madame Galvani, who was teaching her French, told her which streets to avoid because prostitutes raided up and down the we see. So I thought, oh, let's have a, let's have a picture of Patrice in prostitutes in that era. And then they bring a big box full, you know. Yes, so, yes. so, you know, that was the sort of research I went on. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. And, and I have to tell you something. I have a sneaking suspicion that the minute someone said to Ann Lister, don't go to that street because there's prostitutes there. Yes. <laughs> she would go and have a look. Right. A bit like we do in Holland when we go to Amsterdam, perhaps the red yep. lights. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, not, yeah. not I've, I've been to Amsterdam, but I didn't go down that street. <laughs> yeah. I've been to Amsterdam too, and I have not gone down that street either. Oh, good. But, but I can certainly imagine Ann Lister doing that, um, especially because she used to go, she used to leave the house as a child mm -hmm. and go. Oh, yes, what she did. Her, what did she Well, call when her? she was brought up. Um, her, her father bought an estate called Skelfler of the Market Wheaton mm. uh, with his wife's inheritance, I might add. And uh, a bit like um, Anne Lister with Anne Walker's inheritance, yeah. But, but that's what they did those days, isn't it? Yeah. So um, when she was about seven, her mother had to send her away to a dame's school because she was older, because the father was in the army. So he was away in Ireland quelling the, quelling the rebels and that which... Um, which annoyed me because my, 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 those are my ancestors. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, so she was two years at this game school in Ripon. And then when she came back, she was still a handful. And um, as she said, she would be turned nine then. And she used to get out of the bedroom window at night and run into town, which would be perhaps a mile away, if not more. And uh, she would see bad women, as she said. I would see bad women and, um, and bad things. And um, she would go into somebody's farmhouse and watch the rough housing. Um, I think that's... She had quite a life. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, well, in one point, if I may say this, Mayor, yeah. um, the, the, there was this man came in and um, he was on the table, got his penis out of the table, and this woman said, Take that off or else I'll chop it off. You know, she saw things like that, uh, you know, <laughs> 10 years old or something like that, and she loved it. <laughs> and the, the, men, the men would say to her, oh, the lassies are in for a good time when you grow up. You know, and I, I think that a, a lot of the men understood, understood because her father definitely, um, the, the tale that she told was that he once brought a person to sleep with her one night and they had not to be disturbed till half past three in the afternoon, following afternoon. Well, he wouldn't have brought a man. No, no, no father would bring a man. Right. So I understood from that that he brought a woman of the streets to sleep with her, to initiate her into uh, 
sex with a woman. Wow. But uh, what he didn't know was that she probably taught the woman of the streets to hang it too. <laughs> she'd, been, she'd been having sex with women since she was 15. Um, oh you know, yes. Yeah. <laughs> with Eliza Rain, her first lover. Mm. Yes. So, uh, you know, uh, this is all the material that you pick out as you go through all these five million words, you know, some really, really good what stories. A, yes. What a fascinating woman. Unbelievable. So um, at the time that your book was published, uh, mm. this was at the same time that the Thatcherites, uh, Margaret Thatcher, et cetera, managed to pass what was called the Local Government Act, yes. which prohibited local authorities from promoting homosexuality. So that would include museums, schools, et cetera. And I asked you the other day if you ever got any um, pushback from people in Halifax when you first published mm -hmm. the book. And you actually told me two stories, one about Plas Newid uh, with the ladies of oh, yes. Leg Laughlin, and, um, and the other one was about a woman in Halifax. Yes, I've gone to, I've, gone to, I've been invited to give a talk at the Halifax and Peace Society. And uh, there was a uh, woman sat next to me and she was obviously going to give a talk. And um, I could tell she was, was rather proper, shall we say, with double pearls at the neck and everything, you know. And um, she said, oh, are you here to speak? And I said, yes, I am. I said, are you? She said, yes. And I said, what are you speaking on? And she mentioned some antique furniture and that. She said, what are you speaking on? I said, oh, I'm speaking about Anne Lister. She said, oh. You know, someone has written the most horrible book about that woman. And I, I had to say, well, I'm afraid it was me. And she went, and she just looked at me and she actually drew her skirts to one side and then got up and walked off, you know. I thought, oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> and oh. what happened What happened over in Wales at... Uh... Well, yes, I went to, um, you'll have heard of the ladies of Clangoughlin, a lot of you, I'm sure, will have, yes. And they had this idyllic lifestyle, two ladies living together for 50 years. And um, Anne was convinced that their relationship was safe. And um, I went, I thought I must go and see this place. And it is an idyllic spot. Yes, yeah. Oh. And as I was coming, I came down the stairs, I'd gone all around the house, I came down the stairs. And there was uh, this woman um, who was taking money at the door. And um, I said to her, oh, you know, wonderful place. I said, uh, I understand Anne Lister came and visited here. And she went, don't you dare breathe that woman's name in this place. I thought, oh, okay. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Like, what did, they, what did she think she was hiding? Well, I don't know, because those two women had slept together for years. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, and yeah. As, and as they moved away the to do it, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> as, as Anne Lister said, you know, I hesitate to pronounce such a relationship as entirely non-sexual, you know. She didn't say it in any words for that, but she meant Right. Yes. Hey, you know, the, I have a question, and, and we have not talked about this before, but um, it just popped into my head. I wanted to ask you about Frank Pickford, Francis Pickford. Francis Pickford, yes. Yeah. Yes, she was, she was extremely masculine and very, very learned. And Anne was dumbstruck by her, really, because at last she'd come across somebody like herself. I mean, okay, the women that she, she'd been having sexual relations with were all quite feminine and unlearned, shall we say, because Anne Lisa did not like learned ladies. She liked nice, soft, gentle women, you know. Uh, in fact, she didn't, she didn't really advocate an um, education for women. She said it will draw back a curtain that they had best not peek behind. And of course, she meant classical education. Yes. You know, where she, she got all her all knowledge from. Yes. So when Frances Pickford, um, when she met her, she, uh, she realized that she, uh, intellectually and um, with the degree of masculinity that Frank Pickford was, uh, was like um, Frances. And uh, she was she was dumbstruck, and she watched her going up the hill one day, and she went, "I wonder if there are as uh, many such people in as." Yeah, she, she, yeah, she'd met somebody, but she didn't want to have an affair with her. Let's put it that way. She yeah. says, "I don't, I don't like learned ladies. She's too learned for me." Yeah. But she she did manage to to basically get um, 
Frances Pickford to admit that she was gay. Or, oh, yes. Right. She was having I, a, I, I didn't think of that as one of her finer moments. Um, in no, terms she of, was a bit de deceptive there, wasn't she? A bit. A yeah, bit. yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure uh, she was worried about uh, about the, her the family reputation since she lived in Halifax and mm, Frank was just mm, visiting, right? Mm, mm, yes, yeah. she visited her sister. Yes, in Halifax, but she had this lover, Miss Threlfall, that she um, she who was absolutely absolutely drained Miss Pickford of money. Mm. She was in bad bad debt also. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yes, wow. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so the, the, if you're looking at the society in Halifax um, that um, Anne felt she had to mix with, are you? Um, right, right. But um, you on with your next question, yeah? Yeah, so um, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about Anne burying the romantic side of her in the Hastings churchyard. Oh yes, when she was at uh, Hastings. Um, Thea Hobart was a young woman um, of, of the aristocracy, really. Um, she was the um, related to Lady Louisa Stewart in London, and also um, to Sibylla Maclean, I believe, up there in Scotland, yes. Uh, and she was a delicate young lady, and um, th so the family asked Anne Lister if she would be um, Via's companion and uh, take her down to Hastings to get the sea air because she was delicate uh, with her lungs. And they couldn't go on the continent because of cholera or something. So they settled in Hastings. And uh, Anne was about 45 by this time, or then 40 anyway. And um, she fell madly in love with Via. And uh, but Via was quite a cold young woman. And uh, really, she was uh, waiting for this uh, military man to offer his hand in marriage. Uh, but she couldn't resist teasing Anne. She knew that Anne had fallen in love with her. Uh, and she would tease her a bit, let her kiss her on the forehead or something very chastely and all this, you know. Uh, now you have me, now you have me, you know, that sort of situation. Right, yeah. And uh, anyway, this military man um, came and uh, visited them at Hastings and uh, came to dinner and, uh, and Anne left them alone after dinner and when he'd gone she came down and uh, Via said uh, she'd accepted him and Anne said the murder is out mm -hmm. you know, and she went to her bedroom and cried and cried and um, when she came down next day she said uh, to Via um, baby is dead, the child is dead, meaning the love that Anne had for Via. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, she said, um, I, have buried, I have buried the child in the churchyard at the, in the church. And um, Via said, oh, perhaps you might be able to resurrect it, you know. <laughs> oh, no. No, it was a beautiful child, and uh, it will never be resurrected. And um, I think I finished my talk last year with saying, that perhaps in that graveyard, she buried the child, but I think she perhaps buried her own romantic art as well. Yeah. She never again uh, found that sort of romance, and I think she, as I said, built a carapace shell around herself and yeah. said, I'm going to go home, I'm going to um, uh, build shit, you know, and uh, I'm going to find a woman with money and um, settle down. And as she, as she said to Frances Pickford, she said, uh, I'm going to sow my wild oats until mm -hmm. I'm 35. And then I should settle down. And, um... <laughs> you know, it's it really is um, in, in reading the diaries. It's it's very hard when you come to those passages, like when when she talks about the events of Blackstone Edge. It, it's not just her her conversation to herself about Blackstone Edge. It's the way it keeps showing up over and over. It was a such, conversation. Yeah, sorry. A yeah, conversation sorry. about. Blackstone Edge. Oh, Blackstone Edge. Oh, yes, that was a, that was a, the climax, wasn't it? Of, yeah. the, of her disillusionment with, with Mariana, really. Yes, mm. and it shows up in the mm. you know in the next few sections um, of your book or and and the diaries that 
over and over again, she keeps going back to it. She keeps she chewing over on that. Can't get over it. Can't get over it. No, it, it, it was it was really poignant to, to read uh, the way she agonized over it. You know, yeah. and uh, when she said, um, uh, "Love still lingers in its old abiding place," you know, meaning I can't get over Mariana. I still have this love for her, yeah. but she couldn't bear the humiliation. You know, and it, yeah. uh, that was the beginning of the end for her and Mariana, I believe. Well, Very fact, hard. I know. Mm. So then, so having talked about Mariana, and I know that there's a whole bunch of people out there right now doing their Team Mariana, Team Yes, Mariana absolutely. Walker thing. Yes. Uh, but um, let's let's talk a little bit about Ann, Ann Walker and um, what you might think of that relationship. You said to me the other day that you felt like Ann Walker was an enigma. To you? Um, the thing is, we, we know so little uh, of Anne Walker's side, shall we say. Um, she was um, a very um, uh, neurotic woman, I have to say, uh, obviously with reason to be neurotic, part of us well, uh, because of her relationship with Mr. Ainsworth. Uh, what really happened, although I think Sally twisted it a little bit, but as far as I can remember that, when I read about that section, uh, Mr. Ainsworth's wife uh, was a friend of Anne Walker's and uh, she was very, very ill and Anne Walker went over. She was worried about it because the woman was dying and she stayed over. And while the woman was in the room dying, um, Ainsworth seduced Anne Walker. And uh, Anne Walker then had what she thought was a great sin on her soul and she thought she was damned forever. And uh, she had uh, feelings that perhaps she ought to marry Mr. Ainsworth now because you know she'd allowed him so many intimacies. Uh, she didn't actually say what they were, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that sex, um, because you know she was so unsealed. Uh, of course, as we know, I'm soon sent Mr. Ainsworth. Um, but uh, this neurosis, this uh, almost religious neurosis uh, got a real grip on Anne Walker's uh, mentality mm -hmm. and um, she became a neurotic woman uh, and Anne as time went on lost patience with her I'm afraid she was very good at the beginning taking her to see Mr. Uh, Dr. Belkin and uh, Dr. Belkin assessed her and his, um, his um, uh, diagnosis was uh, if Miss Walker were not rich she would not be ill Right. So, you right. know, that was the common sense approach. I don't know whether that would work today, but um, as I say... Uh, well, getting, being busy and having something in your life to focus on certainly does yes. make a difference, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas um, Anne Walker would lay, lay on, the, on the settee, on the sofa, sort of crying because they brought the wrong carriage to the door and um, that she made her give her the wrong colour ribbon for her hair. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, at times you, you sort of, you know, and while you can empathize with, with her because of her, if, if something gets hold of your mind that you have a huge guilt about, which is what, what at, the, at the base of Anne Walker's neurosis, then right. it's, it's not from them, you know. Yes. Um, yes, but um, you have to balance that with the thought that. There were children working in the mines on their ground, you know. And, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Everything wasn't all. Um, <clears throat> everything no. wasn't all perfect in the world, shall we say? No, you know, you, I don't know. But, uh, what were Anne, Anne's, one of Anne's final thoughts about her were, um, and Miss Walker has everything in the world, everything in life she could want, apart from the capacity to enjoy them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely she, ev everything everything that she wants everything to have. right um we're just in uh we're getting a little close to the end of our talking time before we go into q a but i wanted to ask you what are your favorite sections of the diaries that are there are there is there anything in particular that you remember in as is really um touching you in a particular way I think if you're talking about enjoyment, mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I think it was before she 
action, the venereal infection. The, the romance was lovely up to that point. And then it became, it, it was like, you know, the serpent that entered to, you know, to the Garden of Eden. Yes, <laughs> and, yes. Yes, and then in this great worry. If we're talking about um, the time she spent in Paris, I really, really enjoyed that because of the political background and everything. Yes. Uh, so the, the, it, it's degrees of enjoyment, you know, from, from one part of the journals to the other. But certainly that innocent period, I call yes. it, even though they were having, making love and everything, doing things that they shouldn't when she was an old woman. But right. uh, I, got a, I got a shock when, <laughs> when I realised that the venereal complaint um, had entered. And I had a huge amount of... Um, worry shall I say uh, about the ethics of, of, of writing about that you know that that got more bother than anything else but then I thought well you know it, it was her life and you know yes yeah to be taken into account and especially when she went to Paris if I hadn't have talked about it in the first book I wouldn't have been able to talk about it in the second yes so, um, well, I'm glad that you chose to, I'm glad you chose to uh, write about it for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is the fact that STDs are something people should still be careful of. Yes. And, and it certainly did tell us a little bit more about Ann Lister and, and even, you know, how she dealt with that. Um, she didn't inform her lovers about it. No. And... And no, but that's she was a little bit careful. difficult. She was very careful. Mm -hmm. Yes, after that, apart from poor Tib. But anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, all, it's, it's just an, another interesting uh, piece about her. Um, so the last thing I'd like to touch on, Helena, is the, uh, the admission of, the inclusion of the diaries in UNESCO's UK Memory of the World. Oh, what, yeah. How did you feel about that personally when that happened? I felt really vindicated, shall I say, really elated. I thought all those years of work uh, and um, lack of appreciation to a certain extent, apart from a number of academics, nobody seemed to have realized the importance of Anne Lister's journals. Yeah. And I felt that I had validated the years I put in and I had also validated Anne Lister as a, as a figure. Major yeah. importance in the, in the history and literature of, yes. uh, of the UK. I was really over the moon about that. Yes, yes. I was. Yeah, she's well, she, in the right place. Well, well, brava to you for the work that you did in, in bringing Anne Lister into the light and uh, in, in having it um, included in the UNESCO's project and just everything that you've done so far has just been, you've, as I said in the Minster that day, you have educated us and you have entertained us, but you have also changed our lives and we oh, thank you for that's that. That's wonderful to know. Yes. And now... It yeah. is Ann Lister's birthday, and I know we wanted to do something a little oh, special about that. Yes. Where are the glasses? There we go. Here we are. And we have, we have our, many of our viewers out there doing the same thing right now. Yes. We warned them. <laughs> yes. So I will let you make the toast. Well, I am give a toast to Ann Lister, and uh, it is so wonderful that so many people in the world are now aware of her, loving her. And uh, we all hope, I'm sure, that she can rest in peace knowing that her life has been such an inspiration to so many people. Absolutely. Happy birthday, Anne Lister. Cheers. That's a little early for me, Helena. Yeah. It's, not, it's not tea time here. Yeah. Well, before you go, can I just say something that's a little treat for you? If you come over in the autumn, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be very welcome, um, Sally says, to spend a day on the set or uh, of the next series of Anne Lister's uh, Gentleman Jack. And Seriously? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Oh, my yes. God. Oh. Uh, yes. Um, I've got her. Uh, I, I emailed her. And um, she said, uh, you're very welcome, Pat, for all the work you've done. Yes. <laughs>
May I just say to everybody that's watching this, is this is one of the few times you will see Pat Eskate speechless. So thank you. Right. <laughs> wow. That is phenomenal. Holy crap. Okay, well, moving on now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Yes. Um, so let's go now. For, we're going to do some Q&A, and I have the questions are popping up on my text. <laughs> Livia has been catching these as they've come up on the comment screen. So first, uh, this is from Mary Volpe. She wants to know, what reactions did people have when you first started telling them that Anne was a lesbian? The reaction, I, I didn't tell people for a long time, of course. Um, you know, a few intimates, shall I say. Um, I met uh, some resistance uh, from people in the know, mm. um, but uh, eventually I sort of um, battered Battered them away if you like. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it was like, oh well, do you think that you know you ought to be uh, you ought to be making this public? Other writers haven't made it public, and and I was saying, hey, come on, we're in the age of um, you know uh, the information, and yes. um, uh, I was also thinking of my own daughter, of course. Of course, yes. yes. And my theory was that I think that uh, gay women, lesbian women, are entitled to their own sexual instincts. So, um, shall I say that um, the, the um, antagonism, if you like, or the attempts to persuade me to drop it, which were put in place, came from the top rather than, you know, anywhere else. But uh, I, I said no, because um, no, it's in the archives. Uh, uh, I pay my rates here and um, I can publish. Wow, <laughs> really fabulous. <laughs> Oh, golly, you just reminded me of something. Oh, we're not going to go there, though. It was a conversation you had with Dorothy Thompson, but we're going to move on to the next question. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, from Rona Stokes, did you have any idea what impact the show Gentleman Jack and your work would have worldwide? Absolutely not. No. Um, I, I said on the one show, I don't know whether people saw it or not, that I was the backstreet scribe. Right, I and there were these wonderful, uh, gorgeous, uh, glamorous women, Saran, and so you know, and uh, and this brilliant writer, uh, Sally Wainwright. Yeah. So I felt that I'd been in the background so long uh, that that I would stay in the background uh, because the, the Gentleman Jack series was built on Jill Liddington's book, of course, not on not on mine. So right. I. I accepted that and I thought, well, fair enough, you know. And um, I've been absolutely stunned uh, by, by the reception that I've had the gay right. community all over the world. I couldn't believe it. Right. And then I realized that people were so intense about town that they wanted to know, where did this start? Yes. And of course, it, um, it started with my first book. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and yes, and thank you for that, by the way. Thank you um, for everybody for realizing that. <laughs> this question is from Alex Holbrook. Is there anything Anne didn't write that you really wish she had? Something that is a gap in your understanding of her life? Did she leave uh, you wondering? The thing is... Uh, in five million words, it's so comprehensive. I think probably I would have liked to have known more about her as a child. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, what I know about her childhood, I've had to pick out as she's been talking to other people about it. Maria Barlow in Paris, for instance. You know, right. And it's very scanty. Yes. Yeah. The information. I would have liked to complete, you know, sort of, um, if a mother had kept a diary, for instance. Right. And, uh, and written about how she acted and, and that, you know. Yeah, yeah I, th I think I would have liked to have known a lot more about her childhood. Or, or even, even if Marion had, you know, although that probably wouldn't have been too, um, too complimentary. Oh, uh, uh, her sister. <laughs> yes. uh, this, this is from Lynn Schulz. I read a while ago that, oh, this is fabulous because we didn't cover these two things. Wait a second. Okay. Oops. Um, <laughs> Hope and, I can now. <laughs> thank you, Lynn. Uh, first of all, let's all remember, I'm sure most of us do, 
that uh, Helena's new book has, is uh, available in the UK now and will oh, yeah. be shipping from Amazon US, I believe in the beginning of May. I got mine from the book corner. Right. Good. But uh, Lynn Scholl's uh, question is, I read a while ago that you're writing a bi biography of Ann Lister. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And I have been writing it for so many years, I'm getting embarrassed about it. It's <laughs> so lengthy. It's half a million words long already. You know, well, I'm hoping to find a publisher. And, um, you know, I think Mirago might take a look at it. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, but, uh, but yes, and um, it goes into much more detail than the extracts, shall ah. I say. Because, um, and that's why it's taken me so long to do it. Yes. Because I've to go into every, I mean, for instance, the, um, the Eliza Rain uh, story is, is fully tragic. And um, I hadn't got the journal pages for the Eliza Rain stuff when I first started, when my first book came out. Because for some reason or other, the years 1806 to 1810, were put on at the end of all the reels and then from 1810 to 1816 the journal books have been lost oh my so, uh, so there's been that gap between 1810 and 1816 i uh, wonder if they i wonder if they'll come across those someday i don't know it would be lovely yeah I, can i just say that that little book was a little bit more about how i came in uh, to the amnesty stuff and how I felt about it and about my daughter and everything. Yes. Secret Diaries, Past and Present. Yes, yes. yes. another so, wonderful Helena Whitbread another, book. And another little one to, if people are feeling, um, you know, waiting too long for Gentleman Jack to come again, yeah. that's that little book as well. Yeah. Well, we all have our fingers crossed on that one, so, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, here's a question from Succotash Lindsay. As you read through and transcribed Anne's journals, was there anything that struck you as being missing? Something you would have expected to be there, but wasn't? Huh, that's a good question. No, actually. Uh, it, it, she was so, uh, so detailed. Yes. You know, she would, she would start with the time she got up um, and uh, uh, went on later, even her bowel movements she yes. would, would write yeah. about. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I really cannot think that there's anything that she would have missed. You know, she, she would do it virtually hour by hour of what had gone on. You know, at 3.45, I went, you know, took the horses out and, you know, to this sort of thing. Yeah, I think yes. at, this, at this point, I, I think it's pretty easy to look at her as somebody with a really advanced case of OCD. Yeah, well, I think so. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes. But thank, but, but thank God, because we get to I read all that. I know. And then um, this is our last question to you is from Sifra. And Sifra, please uh, forgive me. I think it's Verheiden. What is the most important thing Ann Lister has taught you? To have courage, obviously. Mm. You know, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, look, I look at the way she faced uh, the public every day of her life, knowing that people were talking about her falling after her um the way she coped with adversity uh the 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 the, the, the strength of her character yes i, yes. I, I yeah. think courage strength of character um the ability to go on doing things even when when life is tough you know yes um you know we all go through um, I'm so we like when our parents died, my husband died, yes. lost, you know, through all that, and um, not to my parents' death, but the rest. That there yes. was still a list of there, and it was uh, she had so much courage. Yes. yes. Yes, I think courage through adversity. Yes. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, and and Helena, may I just say that you are a phenomenal role model from that perspective, even just from the the stories that you told us in the beginning of the interview at the age of 45 going back to school after what many would consider a pretty complete life, mm. already a mature adult, et cetera. Yes, and, uh, yes. I'm gonna close by saying that um, it has been both a pleasure and an honor 
to be able to meet you and talk to you. And the several hours that we, we have spent talking in yeah. preparing for this, not just on an analyster level, but on so many different levels, it has been something I'll remember the rest of my life. Thank you. And, and thank you for everything that you've done and just for being you. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes to much everybody. Much. Yes to all of you. And to Unlist. Yes, again. Have a lovely weekend. You too, Helena. Yeah. Very, very Bye. happy to have you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.